Well, folks, it's time for our final card review. We're 16 deep, and uh, we got the Hunter Colossal Legendary Minion and I think 45 other cards. We're going to go through this pretty brisk pace today, but this is Hydra Ladon, and he is a 7-mana Hunter Legendary. He's a 5-5 five five Colossal plus 2, and he has Battlecry give your Hydralon heads rush. Those Hydralon heads have Death Rattle. If you control Hydralon, summon two Hydralon heads. So what that means is because this is a Battlecry, the first two that are summoned immediately will have rush. But any additional ones that summon off the Death Rattles right away will not have rush. So basically, this is a 5-5 that summons two rushing three ones that will then probably be able to trade in pretty successfully and leave you with four three ones on board that if your opponent doesn't deal with in the right order could continue to uh, duplicate. And this is eerily similar to a custom card I just posted. Did that person have inside info? But in a lot of ways, I think it's actually stronger because these rush minions are going to give you some great reactivity. Uh, you've got the nice 5-5 five, five body. You're going to end up with five minions on board after you go through the trade most of the time. So you're going to be left with this giant board that still creates problems for your opponent. So big wide board, pile of stats, instant reactivity, death rattle synergies, beast synergies, A plus across the board. That is everything you'd want in a colossal card for Hunter. So I actually think Hydra Ladon is going to be a five-star Hunter card. This is one of the coolest, I think, Colossals we've seen so far, both thematically and maybe from a power level standpoint as well. Next up here for Hunter is the Harpoon Gun, a new three-mana, three-two weapon. Reads, after your hero attacks, Dredge. If it's a beast, reduce its cost by two. So I think this is another really powerful tool for Hunter. It's got that eagle horn bow stat line, but it's also got this dredge upside where you're increasing the quality of your draw and potentially helping you cheat out some big beasts as well. So yeah, your Colossal could already be five mana, basically, with the Harpoon Gun. That sounds just completely insane and really, really strong as far as I'm concerned. This looks like another really strong four-star card. Moving on here to the Urchin Spines. This is a one mana spell. Your spells this turn are poisonous. So with all the little chip damage that Hunter could do, things like Quest Hunter that are relying on a lot of those little low damage spells, this gives you the ability to use those to clear up larger minions. This is kind of like a Professor Slate in a spell, which, you know, sometimes you'd rather have that body on board, but also sometimes you'd rather have a spell cycling for things like Nagas, having played a spell with a Naga in hand. So this has a surprising amount of utility. I think it'll be limited in use cases. Not every deck is going to have the necessary follow-up to make this worth it. But the decks that do run a lot of spells, this might be important for a turn or two uh, to help stabilize and keep advancing that spell-based game plan. So I think this is a three-star card. Next up is the Conch's Call, a new three-mana spell for Hunter. It's going to draw you a Naga and a spell. And you know what? That's pretty cool. This is basically Arcane and Elect, but with specific card draws. And that can be really useful. If you're only running one Naga and it's Raj Nazjan, the big legendary that's going to help you do tons of damage, this helps you tutor that out essentially and maybe find a damage spell to go with it. Uh, if you're running a bunch of Nagas, this can just be a consistent way to get both things that synergize really well with each other. And it's just Hunter card draw, which can also be pretty valuable as well. So yes, this could theoretically be limited to Naga decks in general, but I don't think it will be. I think actually just running one or two key Nagas and having this as a tutor can make this fit into other decks as well. So because of that, I think it has a lot of utility, making it a four-star card. Moving on to Demon Hunter here with Predation. This is a new three mana Demon Hunter spell. It reads deal three damage and it costs zero if you played a Naga while holding this. Also note that this is indeed a fell spell. So it does have some fell synergies with things like Jace. And uh, I think this is a pretty cool card. It can go face number one, which is important for cards like this. It's not the most efficient damage output at three mana, but the reproducibility as a fell card can be pretty important. And on occasion, the cost discount certainly can help as well to help you cheese out a lot of stuff as soon as possible, maybe even on that Jace turn pushing some damage through. So, uh, you know, this isn't going to be in every deck because three for three is not going to be great. It's going to require either, I think, Fell Setup Synergy or Nagas to really power it, but it'll still fit on occasion in those worlds. So I'm going to say this is a three star card. Moving on to the Bone Glaive for Demon Hunter, a new five mana weapon. This is basically the Arcanite Reaper for Demon Hunter, but it's got a battle cry of Dredge. So it's an Arcanite Reaper that helps you find 
a slightly better draw. And although Arcanite Reaper has had its, you know, moments in the past, I think this one's not quite high enough utility. I think Demon Hunter has access to lots of other ways to push out a bunch of damage and they have other great weapons. And this one feels like it's going to be a little bit too big of a commitment and a little bit too expensive for what Demon Hunter is trying to do. And I don't think the dredge here does enough to really empower this. Like it's kind of cool to have this dredge at the end of an aggro deck so that you can find a, you know, another big follow up. If you're like going into six man in an aggro deck and you need like some burst damage, maybe that's good enough. I guess that's kind of cool in theory, but that's going to require a really face driven deck, which um, Demon Hunter is good at doing damage, but it's not usually like all in face aggro stuff as much anymore. It's it's usually a little bit more nuanced than that. And I don't feel like Bone Glaive fits into that. So uh, I guess it's pretty OK, though, still just as a aggro top end. So perhaps another three star card. All right. Next up here is the Green Thumb Gardener for Druid in a six mana five five Naga battle cry refresh empty mana crystals equal to the cost of the most expensive spell in your hand. That is a bit of a mouthful here, but basically a way to refresh a bunch of mana. If you had 10 mana in the game and you had a 10 mana spell in hand, if you played this when you were at six mana, you could refresh 10 mana crystals off of the green thumb gardener, basically um, spending six to, to gain, you know, 10 back, kind of like a net gain of a four there basically, and allow you to play that big spell that you've got in hand, for instance, you know, in a world of like survival of the fittest, which did just rotate. But as an example, you know, you could follow it up on this minion and maybe make some pretty big plays, getting this five, five on board, getting extra mana and going for that one big commitment turn, which I think is pretty dang cool. Uh, that said, pretty expensive. You got to have a very specific deck list for this. It's got to have big spells. And it's just a 5-5 five, five at the end of the day. Druid has lots of other ways to cheat out minions. So I think there's going to be awkward turns where you don't have a big enough spell in hand. The mana doesn't line up all that well. And this 5-5 five, five just isn't all that meaningful. So I, I do think this one's going to end up being a little bit more awkward than crazy efficient, but still has that utility in those bigger spell decks. Three star card. Next up here is the Dozing Kelp Keeper, a one mana 4-4 four, four Naga. It's got Rush. It starts dormant. But after you've cast five mana worth of spells, it awakens, and uh, I think that's actually pretty crazy. So if you played this on turn one, theoretically, it would pretty naturally awaken on turn three if you played a two mana and a three mana spell. And a 4-4 four, four rush on turn three is still a really impactful card. I think it's a little unlikely that happens perfectly. It's just kind of hard sometimes to line up mana like that. So it might really come down more reliably on something like turn four. Still, though, a 4-4 four, four rush at that point is pretty nice, and this allows you to kind of squeeze it into your turn early so that you're able to do other things you want to do while still taking those swings in the mid game. If you think about that in, say, an overgrowth world for Druid, which, again, I know overgrowth's rotating, but bear with me, you kind of have to take those pass turns in the mid game very often while you're ramping and moving towards your end game goals. This allows you to set up a world where as you're taking those ramp commitments, as you're spending that mana on ramp, you're still able to react to your opponent's stuff, which I think actually is a pretty good setup. So this is just very efficient and I think does often play towards what Druid is looking to do. And if you do top deck in this late in the late game, it's not a problem to summon it right away, right? You're often going to be able to spend five mana immediately after having played it. So I think it still retains that reactivity in the late game as well, which I think makes this a really nice little four star card. Next up here is the Seaweed Strike, a new three mana spell for Druid. It deals four damage to a minion. And if you played a Naga while holding this, it also gives your hero plus four attack this turn. So this can allow you to clear a couple things on board, potentially dealing four twice as needed, or maybe even push some damage face on occasion and like clear a taunt out of the way or just clear a minion out of the way. Uh, four damage for three mana isn't uh, too bad. It's not, you know, it's kind of a druid staple, I guess, in regards to attack. Uh, there are also actually still, still some quest line druid things hanging around where attack can matter. So having another tool to gain attack for quest line druid might be nice. That said, this card isn't like stunning me with efficiency. And I think three mana is actually an awkward amount for druid to commit in a lot of decks just to kind of do things that aren't particularly super defensive. There's not like a ton of life gain or a ton of swing potential on this one. It's kind of honest and kind of straight up. So I think actually most decks will likely leave the seaweed strike behind in favor of more efficient, bigger, more decisive kinds of plays, making this a two star card. Oh my, the seafloor gateway, a new three mana spell for mage. 
draw a mech and reduce the cost of mechs in your hand by one. It's what we always dreamed of. Even more mage mana cheat. <laughs> um, this card's kind of scary. It's got those like Alliance Bannerman vibes where you're drawing a thing and then improving everything in your hand, except it's cost reduction instead of stats in this case, which I actually think supports the mage mech package a little better with things like Mecha Shark, for instance. So yeah, I mean, this is scary for those mid game reloads. It's scary for reducing Gaia the tectonic. It's just more mage focused card draw on a deck that, or mech focused card draw on a deck in a deck that can maybe get to that critical mass of mechs. I'm still not totally convinced this is gonna get there. And I think, you know, Gaia needs to be reduced a couple mana to feel really good. And a lot of these things are gonna be happening in the mid game if you're playing C4, C4 Gateway. And are these mechs good enough to swing in the mid game, even if they're cost reduced? I, I have worries that random mechs aren't gonna be that efficient. So. Uh, this card's scary in a lot of ways. I'm not saying it won't ever get broken, but I think more often than not, because of the way this pushes the discounts into the mid game, they're very specific in nature, you know, unlike spells, which can do a billion different things. This is exactly max. I don't know if they'll have enough recovery potential, so I'm actually going to limit this one to three stars. All right, so the Hearthstone website died, so we're moving over to out of cards here to save the day uh, with the Paladin cards. Next up's Holy Maki Roll. It's a one mana holy spell for Paladin, and it reads Restore 2 Health, Repeatable this turn. So this has uh, kind of Shaman Witch's Brew vibes, but a one mana spell, which, man, shenanigans are always possible with cards like this. Any sort of repeatable this turn effect can start to do crazy stuff. Cost discounts can do crazy stuff. We've got holy spell synergies on this one. Sometimes it's just like a heal 20 in a desperation play. So no, I don't think every deck is going to run this card. Of course, some won't care about this. Some won't need it. But some way to cheese this card feels like it's going to be possible. So I think you got to acknowledge this can do some crazy stuff in the right environment, which makes it a four star card. And then next up here, we've got the Bubble Bot, a new Paladin Mech Minion, a four mana, four, four. I love the art on this one a lot. He's got a battle cry, give your other mechs divine shield and taunt. So a uh, big old pile of bubbles in this case, if you can get yourself a nice little mech board building. And I do have some concerns on this one the same way I do with Eni Storm Coil, where sometimes it's going to be hard to line up the mechs on board to make sure that this thing makes sense. But here's the deal. It's a mech by default, and its stat line is more in line with its cost, unlike Eni. So although this does have the same risks, it's also a turn earlier, and I think it's a little easier to keep a mech on board, say, like on turn three with Divine Shield going into four. Whereas as you get later and later into the game, your opponent has often more reactivity to deal with your stuff. So I think this is kind of like an Eni Storm Coil in a lot of ways, uh, as far as the follow up that's necessary to have a mech on board, but it's easier to achieve. And it's a mech itself, which also creates other additional synergies and upsides. And I think you really only need one to make this feel good in a mech deck like that. Divine Shield can be a really big deal as a follow up. But if you get two or three in the mid game, that's where this card really starts to sing. So Still limited in the two case, still demands follow up, still has those restrictions in place. But I think this one manages to squeeze itself up to a three car star card, three star card status. That's really easy to say, despite those challenges, because um, occasionally it's just going to be the mech that's necessary to get enough mechs in a mech paladin deck. Even if it's not the perfect mech, the best follow up use case, it's just going to be necessary. And that makes it a three star card. All right, next up for Priest is Whispers of the Deep. Sick artwork on this one. Shadow spell, one mana. It silences a friendly minion, then deals damage equal to its attack, attack randomly split among all enemy minions. So this is actually more silence priest support, which is kind of crazy. It gives you instant reactivity while also activating a silence on your minion. And in some cases, even if you're not in a silence priest world, this could still be the kind of card uh, that in a pinch, you don't care about silencing your stuff. Sometimes it's just a body on board anyway. You've already got the effect because it's a battle cry or whatever it is. This can be a cheap way to potentially remove a lot of your opponent's stuff, giving you a very efficient kind of board clear. So I don't know if a lot of decks will want to run that. Committing to running this might be tough, but off random generation, I think this will often, often be a really awesome play that just, gives you a nice little board clear out of nowhere. That's gonna be important. I also think there's technically a Silence Priest world 
for Whispers of the Deep as well. I'm not convinced that deck's going to be super competitive, but this is the kind of card that would help enable it and help it get there. So I think Whispers of the Deep is a three-star card and often going to feel really good off Discover and Generation effects. Next up here, we have Queen's Guard, another priest minion. It's a 2-3 Naga for two mana. Battle Cry gain plus one, plus one for each spell you've cast this turn. So we've got some spell spam stuff. If you didn't hear, Lyra and Radiant Elemental are also coming back in the core set. So there might be some real cheese ability with a card like Queen's Guard, particularly in combination with Radiant Elemental. You've also got Valish refreshing mana. I think there will be instances in the mid game where this could easily come down with three, four or three to four extra stats, you know, making it basically a five, six, a six, seven on occasion for two mana. Now, will decks doing that care about those stats on board? Will they be able to leverage those into victories? Those are challenges for a card like this, but I think this hyper efficient follow up to spells where you're already maybe generating a lot of stuff, you're having these crazy blow up turns and then you just dump this and that's kind of a bonus to everything you've already done and it creates a lot of problems across the board for your opponent, but with value, the stats on board, all of that together could be pretty interesting. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and say Queen's Guard is a four star card. <clears throat> Next up here is Illuminate. Lyra's back and we got Illuminate, a zero mana priest spell, Dredge. If it's a spell, reduce its cost by three. So pay zero mana now to reduce the cost of some insane spell by three. Of course, this is crazy. Naga synergy, spell spam synergy, Lyra generation synergy, holy synergies. It just does a lot. Zero mana spells like this often find ways to get played. No, it's not drawing you a card right away, but it's giving you quality and it's giving you cost reductions for blow up turns, for Lyra turns, for setup turns. All of that feels very powerful to me. This again feels like a four star card. All right, moving over to Rogue, we have the Swift Scale Trickster, a four mana 2-2 two, two Naga with Balakrai. Your next spell this turn costs zero. That's kind of crazy. We just got that eight mana spell for Rogue that draws a bunch of cards. This suddenly becomes a four mana spell <laughs> that gets you a 2-2 two, two and draws you a bunch of cards. This is intriguing, right? This could find ways to break the game. I don't know what it's going to look like, but there are potentially huge cost reductions available here with the Swift Scale Trickster. Also some Naga and Spell stuff tied together here as well. And I mean, I think there are going to be instances where playing a 2-2 and drawing five cards and activating some Death Rattles is a very real play for Rogue. And of course, there are other big spells that might pop in as well that make a lot of sense with the Swift Scale Trickster. So yeah, this looks like a really solid four star card all right next up here's the swordfish three mana two three battle cry dredge if it's a pirate give this weapon and the pirate plus two attack and uh man that's a lot of stats basically because you're putting this in a pirate deck there's a really good chance you're gonna find that pirate uh you're also just getting the upside of dredge like just getting a better card next turn is awesome but also you're getting a four three weapon which could really push out some heat plus you're buffing that pirate that of course could be a mr smite or a charge minion or some other upside on the attack but i think the weapon alone just getting a four three for three mana is really gonna help you push some crazy face and in a pirate deck you have to imagine they're going to value things like face pressure and damage output quite a lot so swordfish seems like a pretty cool card it's doing a handful of different things uh which is exactly what you need for this sort of card so i think swordfish is a four star card man we're giving a lot of fours but everything's good Next up here is Gone Fishing. It looks like Nat Pagel's caught himself a boot. It's one mana, it's dredge, and it's combo. Draw a card. So this is basically tracking most of the time because you're getting to pick your card, and very often this will be easy to combo. I mean, ridiculously easy to combo at one mana. So it's just tracking, and tracking is a really, really good card. And this, of course, also has cheap spell synergies, which are great for Rogue. They love cycling cheap cards in general. So Gone Fishing looks really, really good. This is another four star card. Everything is four stars. All right, next up for Shaman, we got a new totem, the Anchored Totem, a two mana zero three totem. Reads, after you summon a one cost minion, give it plus two, plus one. So this is actually more Piranha support. Play this, play a bunch of the Piranhas, and they're really going to have some crazy attack value scaling. Like, you know, it's going to be easy to get those things up to like five, six attack if you play a few in a given turn, which 
um, I still actually don't think is going to be awesome. It's just a lot of stuff to have to do, and it's not like they're going face. They're just going to have trades or other great ways to clear boards than committing four or five minions. I mean, if they do stick and you're not like trading them in right away, I think they're pretty easy to remove. They're often going to have only two health in most cases since it's their attack that's scaling most primarily and not their health. So it's just like you're building this whole deck and committing to this package that I'm not really seeing how you're leveraging it into victories. I don't think the Colossal Minion is going to be enough support to make it good. I don't think Anchored Totem is enough support. It just feels like this really big package commitment that's going to be tough. Now, outside of that, is Anchored Totem worth it? I don't really see it in that case either. You don't often want to run a ton of one drops in your deck. The Piranhas are there to help fix that problem so that you don't have to run a bunch of one drops. If that doesn't work, if you're not going to run a bunch of one drops in your deck, where does Anchored Totem land? I'm not sure this is going to be good enough. It just doesn't feel like it to me. Kind of feels like Rush Warrior, but worse. <laughs> like the old Rush Warrior deck. Uh, it had the same kinds of setups with cards like Parade Leader and such, but I felt like they had the hand buff stuff to get the minions scaled more in hand, had more health, had, had better follow-ups basically. So... I think this is unfortunately just going to come up short, which I'm sad about because this looks like an awesome totem, but I think it's only going to be two stars. Next up here is the Void Gill, a new two mana Murloc that really seems to tie together everything we're going to care about uh, for, for Murloc Warlock. This is a two mana three, two death rattle. Give all Murlocs in your hand plus one plus one. So this is another way to scale up in hand how big your Murlocs can be. And it, it's really coming together for this mid rangey Murloc deck. Usually we had these hyper aggressive Murloc decks in the past, way back in the beginning of Hearthstone. We had uh, Murloc Warlock as a hyper aggressive deck. Now you're getting this kind of like, I'm going to dump a bunch of stats in the mid game deck with cards like Void Gill. But this is a neat little card. It does a lot. I'm still not totally trusting in this package. I don't believe in it a lot yet. I don't think it's going to get there, but man, this is the right kind of card for it. It just feels good in a lot of ways. So I'm going to say Void Gill is a four star card. All right, next up here is Rock Bottom. It's a one mana spell. It summons a one one Murloc, then it dredges. If that's a Murloc, it's going to summon one more. So if you're committing to a Murloc package, you have to assume very often you're going to get two one one Murlocs here out of Rock Bottom, which help you kind of push into your Murloc strategies. And uh, on turn one, I don't think two one ones are as compelling as they used to be back in the day. So I'm not as excited there. Theoretically, in the mid game, if you're playing this with, say, like your sunken Asharin card, you could maybe buff these right away because they're going to it's going to buff the battlefield as well. So these could be like two twos for one mana. That's a little more exciting, but still doesn't seem to stretch that far. The dredge upside here can definitely be useful with things like the sunken Ashara card. So I, I don't want to disregard that, but ultimately this still feels like a fairly low output card to me. Not as compelling in the in the in the Murloc package. So I think this one's only going to be three stars. All right, next up here is Dragged Below, another Abyssal Curse card for Warlock. We were wondering where these were going to be. It's four mana, deal four damage to a minion, and give your opponent an Abyssal Curse. So again, I feel like this is just a really inefficient uh, curse giver and. Uh, like, yes, your opponent has to pay this tax to remove the curse, but you're paying the tax because your spell is hyper inefficient. It's really not that good for four for four to a minion only just doesn't hold up in Hearthstone these days. So I just still don't see this Abyssal Curse thing coming together. Feels like it's going to take too long. You're going to commit too much mana and it's going to take too long to snowball for your opponent to really feel the downside. They're probably just going to ignore the first few curses and do their thing while you're making hyper inefficient plays. So you're paying the overhead tax on all of these inefficient plays before they are. And it's just going to put you too far behind for aggro matchups in particular. It feels like they're just going to swarm you. So I think, unfortunately, this is only a two star card. Here is another curse card, the Syracas Cultist, a three mana two, three battle cry, give an opponent uh, an abyssal curse. And again, exact same story. You're playing a three mana two, three that doesn't do anything really for quite a while. And I'm glad we're getting enough curse cards. Like, you know, it's going to be fun to try to make this work, but the same problems, you know, your opponent's going to be playing big, crazy stuff. They're going to be smorking you. They're going to be hitting you really hard. They're going to be advancing their win condition. They're going to be finding their OTK and you're just going to be stacking up these curses slowly while making really bad plays. You're playing a two, three on three. You're dealing four damage to a minion on four. That's just going to let you get swarmed in most cases. Like, yes, 
Certainly against some control decks that might uh, allow you to achieve this critical mass, but they might also just play the curses and not really feel any pressure or heat because that's all you're doing. You're not really committing any extra stuff on board. So you have to have this magic window where decks need to do other stuff and um, can't either spend mana on the curses or they can spend mana on the curses, but they're not under pressure enough. It just, it, it feels awkward to me. Maybe we have to see this in action. Maybe it's gonna come together better than I think, but for now, I think Sira Keskultus is another two star card. Next up here for Warriors from the depths, a new three mana spell. It reduced the cost of the bottom five cards in your deck by three, then you dredge to pull one of those cards to the top of your deck. So this is a 15 mana cost reduction for three mana, which is kind of crazy. There are lots of dredge tools. There's Sir Finley. We can just grab those five cards right away and have them all in hand. Uh, you know, if your hand is big enough to swap, essentially, that is crazy and scary. This card looks really strong. Put some Colossals down there, reduce all their costs, get five really cheap Colossals in hand. Like there is just a million things you could do with From the Depths here essentially. And you can play two of these actually as well. So uh, this looks really strong to me. This looks like a five star card potential for sure. Next up's the Obsidian Smith, a two mana three two pirate with Battlecry Dredge. If it's a minion or a weapon, give it plus one plus one. So uh, some interesting pirate shenanigans here of course quest lion is always looking for pirates i think this is a halfway decent one you're not giving up too much i think this is better than like blood sail raider for instance same base stat line and you've got this dredge upside to help improve the quality of your draw which can be good in the late game if you need to fill mana or fine in the early game to help you find your curve and then you've also just got this buff upside it's very likely to be a minion or a weapon and then you know you're gonna draw this really powerful thing on curve so Obsidian Smith actually looks really good in Pirate Warrior, and maybe it's even okay beyond that, just because it's got some upside and some, some base uh, dredge value as well. So I think this is probably a four-star card. Moving on here to Forged in Flame. This is a two-mana spell. It destroys your weapon and then draws cards equal to its attack, and it's a fire spell, which is always cool. Maybe some multi-caster utility there. And uh, yeah, this is potentially a lot of card draw. And I think it's actually really interesting in something like Quest Lion Warrior, Pirate Warrior, where you're getting these weapons every turn. You don't always want to go face with them and maybe just using this to draw like three cards because you got a three attack weapon is going to be worth it in a lot of cases. So uh, I think there will be decks that are willing to sacrifice their weapon just to get some upside, especially if they're buffing weapons. We've seen a lot of buff weapon throughput and drawing cards in Hearthstone, of course, is really good. And I think often getting three or four out of this is possible and will certainly feel good for a two mana play, even in exchange for that weapon. One durability, if you know it's your last durability, isn't necessarily a lot to give up for a ton of card draw. If you're pivoting, changing game plans, looking for maybe over the top damage, this can provide all of those outs. So I think this is a four star card. Next appears Guard the City, a two mana spell. It gains you three armor and summons a two three Naga with taunt. And uh, man, I love cards like this. I really, really want this to be good. <clears throat> it's like efficient armor gain that also Gets you a nice little speed bump on board to slow down your opponent. Uh, you basically get like a 2-3 taunt minion that gives you 3 armor. That's great. And it's a spell too, so you could run this and stuff like big decks. Uh, if you need to fill in the gaps without actually having minions, this is a great way to do that. So cards like this always have that little bit of utility. That said, I don't know if it's enough to keep up in modern day Hearthstone, sadly. I hope it is. This is like the perfect Hearthstone card for me. I just love everything about this. That said, I still think it's going to end up feeling a little bit underwhelming, believe it or not. So I hope to God I'm wrong, but I think this is only a three star card. All right, next on here, we're moving to some neutral cards. Got Quite a few of these, gonna pick up the pace even more. This is a six mana card Mothership, a five four mech with Rush, and Death Rattle summon two random mechs that cost three or less. So a uh, big old pile of mechs kind of has that like piloted shredder slash uh, piloted sky golem vibes basically, but it does have rush for some immediate reactivity and you're getting two bodies. You got Death Rattle synergies. There's actually a surprising amount of stuff going on in this card. Uh, normally I'd say this is a two-star card, but with Rush, it's like, man, there's actually a chance mech decks could use this. Feels like it's probably the thing that's better in random generation. It's like, oh yeah, this is great for me now that I've randomly discovered it, but it might still get played actually. I think this is, believe it or not, a three-star card. Next up here is the Twin Fin Fin Twin. 
three mana two one Murloc with Rush and Battlecry summon a copy of this. And yeah, you know what? That's actually not that bad. Just getting two bodies here is pretty decent at default because they do have Rush. It's kind of like uh, Horn of Rathion reactivity, of course, not drawing you the card, but still. Uh, I know how good that feels on board sometimes, but also it's a copy. So if you hand buff this in Warlock in particular, that can be a big old pile of stats. This might have like plus one, plus one, plus two, plus two. Suddenly it becomes a very efficient sort of hand buff uh, follow up. So, man, I actually think the twin fin fin twin is a four star card. Next up's the Vicious Slither Spear, a one mana one three that reads after you cast a spell, gain plus one attack until your next turn. So this kind of has like mana worm or mana feeder vibes. You play this, you follow it up with a bunch of spells. You hit your opponent really hard. Now it's it's more like mana feeder. Is that the name of that card? I, I don't know. The one three that uh, that that scales like mana worm. You know what I'm talking about? Old old card. Uh, but it's it is short term, so you know it's kind of that one term punch. It's not like mana worm, but persists as a threat on board. Um, I don't think cards like this are good enough anymore. Like it's hard to stick minions these days in Hearthstone, so setting this up in, in advance and then having your big blow up turn is really hard. I think so. Although used to this would have been scary in that kind of world, I don't think it has quite as much utility these days. I think this is unfortunately just a two star card. Mana Addict. Mana Addict, I think, is the name of the card. Uh, this is Helmet Hermit, a new one mana for three with can't attack. This is basically a Silence Priest setup card, and it's at one mana, which is pretty nuts. And the health here makes me nervous, but Priest has ways to boost health pretty reliably. So they could silence this quickly, use it to remove something that four attack with the new spell. It's pretty interesting at one mana in particular. I, I still have doubts like I think this is probably going to be a little too easy to remove or, you know, demand a little bit too much mana simultaneously to really bump it up to the stats where it's hard enough to remove. This is one of those where it's really hard to read until you play this deck, but Silence Priest has often lacked reactivity. That new spell helps, though, so I'm actually going to give Helmet Hermit three stars, believe it or not. I, Silence Priest might actually be a lower tier fringe meta deck with some viability. Next up here is the Barbaric Sorceress, a six mana three seven Naga with Taunt and Battlecry. Swap the cost of a random spell in each player's hand. So theoretically, you know, you have a big 10 mana spell. You know your opponent's running a lot of cheap spells. You could rip the Barbaric Sorceress and ruin their spell in hand, but also, you know, discount yours, which it, it, it's intriguing. There's also theoretically a world where you could use this as kind of a combo disruptor where, you know, they're relying on some cheap spell for their combo and then you make it way too expensive for their combo. Normally, I'd give this card one star because I think six mana is just too big of a tax for that sort of shenanigan. But because of that combo disruption potential, this might eke its way up to two stars. There might be certain metas where that's a really fringe, inefficient way to deal with some very specific combo. Next up here is the Gorlock Ravager, a five mana, four, three Murloc with a battle cry, draw three Murloc. So another mid game reload that could help you in a uh, mid rangey Murloc deck to either create some stuff in hand for hand buffs or maybe just to follow up uh, with another big dump turn where you're dropping a pile of stats. Like, I, five mana is a lot to commit, but it is instant draw, which is good. It's a lot of draw and it's not necessarily an awful body. It's, I mean, it's obviously weak for five mana, but it's not like, you know, no body or a one one or something. And it might be hand buffed as well or Sunken Asharan buffed and um, like, you know, deck buffed basically. So could often be like a 5-4 or a 6-5. So yeah, sure enough, I think it's decent. I <laughs> Is Murloc Warlock actually going to get there? I think Gorlock Ravager is a three-star card. All right, next up's the Selfish Shellfish, a four mana 7-7 seven, seven death rattle. Your opponent draws two cards. Four mana seven seven memes are back. And this has a downside of making your opponent draw cards. So you play a big thing, but they get some more resources in hand. Uh, that said, you know, there are, of course, mill shenanigans possible, you know, make this an upside instead of a downside. But I don't think it's that crazy of a downside these days. There are so many decks that are so good at drawing cards anyway there's kind of diminishing returns often on their card draw. They already have eight choices in hand. What's two more really going to make a difference? And occasionally the stats here might actually stick and be relevant. There are some decks that have like beast synergies or death rattle synergies in particular, or I wonder if this couldn't maybe just be worth it. Four mana seven, seven is not as scary as it used to be, 
but there may not necessarily be a lot of risk here with the selfish shellfish so man i wonder if this isn't a three star card Next up here is the Puffer Fist, a 3-mana three 3-4 three, pirate with after your hero attacks deal one damage to all enemies. So basically here, uh, this does go face. It doesn't just hit enemy minions, which is always intriguing. That said, uh, there is a lot of you know demand here. It's hard to attack multiple times in a turn. So usually this is just going to kind of be a one damage AOE, which won't really be enough to react to boards and won't really be a lot of damage to pump out. Uh, obviously, there are weapons and, and ways to increase that number that might enable the Puffer Fist to do a little bit more. Plus, it is a pirate, which is not inherently awful for something like Pirate Warrior, just to get a solid pirate body. Uh, you know, it's kind of worse than Cannoneer, I think, for Pirate Warrior specifically, but it's not altogether uh, different. It, it does very similar things. So I think the Puffer Fist is actually another three star card. Usually, I you know, all these neutral cards like one and two stars, but they actually seem pretty dang good this time, which is crazy. This is the Treasure Guard, a three mana, one five Naga with Taunt and Death Rattle draw a card. And uh, I think this one's actually pretty weak. Uh, yes, it's disruptive on board, but that one attack doesn't contest very well. As we know, that's just going to get ran over and you're only really getting a little bit of card and a tiny, tiny stall on your opponent, you might say, well, this is kind of like a shield block. It kind of is, but it's just not that good, and most decks will have better opportunities to run cooler things. So I think Treasure Guard is a two-star card. Next up here is the Sea Scout Operator, a uh, three mana, two, four, with Battle Cry. If you control a mech, summon two, two, one mecha fish. And we do know there are some upsides in summoning uh, a few mechs, like getting those mechs to hang around and chill is nice. This is also just a pile of stats, like three bodies for three mana uh, with, with some reasonable attack values isn't bad at all. The downside here is you do have to control the mech, and I think that's going to be fairly hard sometimes still to activate on curve uh you need really sticky stuff it's harder to stick minions in hearthstone these days and i think this has pretty big diminishing returns post three mana if you play this off curve you're far less excited i think about the operator but uh still solid just you know mech bodies and and mech follow-ups might be necessary for some of these early mech decks like paladin and mage to get there, they just need enough cards, so this can sometimes slot into the bottom of the list as a three-star card. Next up here is the Reef Walker, a three mana three two elemental with battle cry and death rattle. Summon a one one piranha swarmer. So, man, more piranhas number one. But I actually think this card's not bad at a base level, even ignoring any piranha synergy upside. It's just a lot of stuff. It's two bodies right away with a little bit of reactivity, and then it's also got that death rattle as well. That's not something most decks are going to care enough about, right? But it's surprisingly interesting for a neutral kind of throwaway card. So Reef Walker's going to get two stars here instead of one. I think most expansions, this would have been the kind of thing that is a one-star card, but it's pretty dang intriguing even for a neutral three-drop. Moving on here to the Naval Mine, a two-mana zero-two mech with death rattle deal four damage to the enemy hero so cards like this you know you never know exactly how they're going to work but that's a pretty interesting death rattle and there are always ways to copy cards resummon cards duplicate cards cheese cards and that means naval mind has a real chance to find a deck somewhere along the line there's going to be some way to use this to either just pump out reliable damage or maybe some kind of like crazy uh otk stuff as well so uh, don't write off Naval Mine. This is actually a four star card. Next up here's the Rainbow Glow Scale, a two mana, two, three Naga with spell damage. We've uh, had a few of these two mana spell damage cards in our past, Kobold Geomancer and stuff. And of course, this creeps those as a two, three, and it's a Naga. And theoretically, you might care about having some spell damage in a Naga deck that needs enough Naga. That said, I still don't think this card is going to be there for most decks. There are just bigger, better things you can do very often. And I think there are enough other good Nagas that advance your game plan more directly or more, you know, impactfully than just spell damage plus one. So I think Rainbow Glow Scale is only a two star card. Next up here's the Security Automaton, a two mana, one three mech. After you summon a mech gain, plus one, plus one. Uh, cards like this are intriguing. You know, we just saw that card that summons two mechs, and it's like, man, that immediately makes this a 3-5 with additional scaling. That's kind of scary, but I think at two mana, it's just going to be a little bit too awkward. Basically, if you play this on two, it's almost never going to stick. 
And then it gets harder and harder to kind of follow it up and make it compelling because as you get later into the game, it's often easier and easier to remove. So I, I think this is going to fall in an awkward spot. That said, man, scaling like this is kind of spooky. So I'm still going to give the automaton here a three star rating. All right, next up here is the Murkwater Scribe, a two mana three two Naga with Battlecry. The next spell you play costs one less. So uh, keep in mind that does not say this turn. So this is something you can bank into the future, which is really the only reason you often want to do this. Paying two mana to get a bad body and a one mana cheaper spell isn't going to be worth it. Same turn very often. You'll feel kind of bad to have just gotten a three two out of it, but maybe to cheat out a spell on a future turn. There's something there that said, I still don't think this is going to get there. Like I said, for our previous Naga card, I feel like there are more uh, just impactful, immediate, bigger, more important Naga options than this. So most decks won't really care to cheat out a spell by only one mana might be too awkward to use. So two star card. Next appears the Click Clocker, a one mana, one, one mech with Divine Shield and Battle Cry. Give a random mech in your hand, plus one, plus one. So this has that sort of Argent Squire baseline with actually some decent hand buff action and some mech synergies. If you're going to get sticky mechs on board and start building off of those, I think cards like Click Clocker don't hurt. You just need sticky one drops sometimes. And this is feeding back into your hand immediately. So this could be a decent part of the mech package for a handful of decks. I think Click Clocker is another three star card. Oh my God, every card is actually decent. You, normally there's a bunch of garbage. My ratings are gonna be way off, but I think that wraps it up for all the, all the cards here. Click Clocker was last, so uh yeah that's it for sunken city some pretty nutty stuff this expansion a lot of like average feeling cards but that's a good thing and usually usually there's a lot of garbage cards so intrigued to see what comes together and what's there silence priest looks nutty the hunter colossal looks cool curious to hear your thoughts on all these cards and more down in the comments below thanks so much as always for watching stay tuned for more coverage of the course set and news and patch notes and all that stuff i wanted to get cards out first then we'll talk more about all that stuff later but uh, thank you, love you a ton, and until next time, game on.